No. We always have one of our colleagues here at the Institute <laughs> primed to ask a question to break the ice. Uh, my, my takeaway, uh, Gary and Steve and, and Jason, is that this is sort of the, uh, you know, special agreement, whether it's aircraft or whether it's uh, within, the, within the context of WTO, you've got this great killer, which is a consensus requirement. But you've also got the, ex the, the way out of the consensus killer, which is that like-minded nations can go the extra mile. Uh, so your strategy seems to be basically since, you know, 12 or 15 countries produce 85 or 90 percent of the global emissions, carbon dioxide, let's use this model in WTO, get these big emitters lined up to a gentleman's agreement, uh, and you pretty much got the thing solved. Is, am I hearing that right? Uh, and if so, how does that relate to whatever might be negotiated on the climate uh, in the in the context of the United Nations uh, in a convention that Rio Treaty and Copenhagen? Well, let me uh, just make uh, two comments on that, two or three. Uh, first of all, if the um, UN FCC reaches some general agreement on kind of the trade aspects of, of climate change measures, uh, it seems likely that would be given quite a bit of weight by the WTO, though uh, Steve can go into the, to the legal nuances and, and uh, certainly the WTO is not compelled to give weight to everything happening in other bodies, but in this case probably a lot of weight. Secondly, I think your your observation, your, your summary of our code of good practice is, is accurate. It's a good, good summary. And the third point I might make, which isn't in answer to your question, Bill, but is, came to me as, as um, Steve was going over the, the details of the WTO. There might be people, maybe not in this room, but in other rooms, who say, gee, this is a lot of fussy stuff. Let's just discard it and just write our climate rules how we want and go for you know, whatever is best for reducing CO2, you know, let the WTO accommodate. And I can, can see how people might get that sense of frustration. That would be, I think, a, just a terrible mistake for the world trading system because this, as Steve said, is no small thing. And if we don't maintain a semblance and a lot of the context of WTO rules, I think this has the potential for wrecking the system, the trading system, because there's so much money at stake, so much room for um, putting up barriers that the disciplines we now have, which are actually holding moderately well in this uh, deep uh, recession, could be blasted away. Yeah, I would just add, uh, you know, a trading system is a terrible thing to waste. And uh, this, uh, a lot of cases, uh, trade wars with respect to climate, uh, concerns about whether the WTO is standing in the way of the climate regime. This is a pretty serious challenge, um, and much worse than it was in the early 90s when there was a trade environment challenge that we thought was serious at the time, but this one is much more so. And so our charge in writing the book was to look for ways of heading off uh, this kind of collision, and we've proposed lots of ways. Now, are they doable? They would all be be difficult. And the code that we propose could be non-binding. It could also be a legal agreement among like-minded countries. Uh, but there, what we're, I guess our overall message is let's get talking about this between countries, which has not yet occurred at the WTO and has not occurred within the climate regime. There has really been no forum where governments have talked about heading off these, uh, these disputes. Let's get working on this now so that uh, we'll have a framework in place to avoid uh, big cases going to the WTO. We have three questions over here. I'll go one, two, three, and ask you to identify yourself and then fire away. All right, Carl Dahlman, Georgetown University. Thank you very much. I think it was a very comprehensive uh, overview of the difficult subject. And just to follow up on, on Bill's question, what, what worries me is that 
you are proposing a system so that we don't have a breakdown of WTO in the trading system, and I, I agree with that. But when I get worried is when you say a gentleman agreements among like-minded countries, and the, the big emitters are not like-minded, and you showed us how far apart, all the way from historical to per capita to uh, just a, you can do it per GDP or just the absolute amounts. The distance there is so big that I get a little worried that we're still on a big collision course and that we can't, I mean, what's the likelihood we can get the like-minded agreement when we have such disparate things? If we can't get that, then we have a big risk of the system collapsing, maybe moving to protectionism. So if you could just comment on that because it seems well, somewhat alarming. Yeah, I mean, it, getting 153 WTM members to agree to something is very hard, um, particularly in the, in the current atmosphere of the WTO and the problems of the Doha round. Uh, but it would be possible to get a, a smaller group of countries to agree to something outside of the WTO that um, they could use to govern their mutual legal relationships with each other. And uh, we say in the book that it, you know that we could get the major emitters doing it, then that would be a good code for for most of world trade and most of world emissions, and that would that would serve as a second best perhaps to a WTO agreement. But it would also be valuable if you got some agreement between the United States and the European Union on these issues. Uh, and if you could add Japan and Canada and a few other countries, so much it becomes I think I think quite viable to to, to look for some uh, smaller group that could propose a code that would govern their, govern their own relationships. Uh, Frank Loy was, I think, the chief U.S. negotiator at Kyoto. Uh, he has the distinction, probably, of being the only U.S. negotiator who ever brought an agreement back that was immediately repudiated by a unanimous vote in the U.S. Senate. <laughs> With that background, he has exquisite sensitivity to these issues, and so I want to recognize him for a question. Frank. Thanks for that very generous introduction. <laughs> uh, let me remind myself not to come here again. <laughs> um, no, uh, but I had a practical question. I mean, if I understood you correctly, you said that the WA challenges are to the law as applied rather than to the law as written. Uh, and uh, therefore, one needs experience. If you're a, a U.S. negotiator or somebody trying to craft a U.S. domestic piece of legislation, uh, would you not say that given the uncertainties that you've talked about, about like products, about whether process is an element in a like product, whether energy can be considered to be an element of a product. Given all these uh, uncertainties, and given um, the fact that, for example, Buy America provisions sometimes look a lot more, look a lot worse than they are, and the, because when you sort of analyze them, they actually have a lot of holes in them and are not as uh, trade averse as you might think. Given all of that, it, isn't there a good argument that the climate people have to move ahead with, with their uh, regime, uh, take the chances that uh, in some way some of these uncertainties are going to be resolved against them, uh, but deal with them then, rather than add to the incredible complexity of the, both the law and the international negotiations by trying to, to do all the things that you suggest? Let me leap in and say that uh, um, a couple of people just before the session uh, told me about uh, some of the details of the Waxman Markey uh, bill, which has come down. And uh, the, I think a very good feature in this area is that they leave a lot of discretion to the administration on how, uh, you know, uh, free allowances would be given on the export side. How, uh, which we don't really think is a great idea, but at least give discretion and how uh, permits on the imports would be allocated and so forth. And so I think you don't need to resolve all these questions if the Congress is willing to give that kind of discretion to the administration to a greater extent than in the Boxer Bill, which is the leading bill of last year. Yeah, I mean, I would just add, yeah, there's a, there's a, a tremendous temptation in the United States government, given how powerful we are, 
to legislate first and then you know ask questions and be challenged later. I mean, we see we see it in the in the trucking uh, episode with with Mexico, the cotton uh, legislation, the steel tariffs that went on under under the early uh, Bush and, uh, administration, the Byrd Amendment. Lots of cases the United States has lost in in disputes where. Um, uh, the policymakers, I'm sure, knew what, what they were doing was a, was a violation, but did it anyways. And if you do that under the WTO, there, there are no reparations you have to pay. You can wait two or three years uh, before your case is adjudicated. Gary Horlick, who was here earlier, used to call this the three-year free pass that you get when you violate WTO law. But all that has costs on United States reputation, on provoking actions by other countries, on the, on the trading system. Uh, and so we, we would not want to counsel uh, the government, well, you know, given that WTO law is a bit uncertain on a lot of these things, go ahead and do what you think you need to do and we'll fight these challenges in, in 2011. Uh, that's not what we would want to counsel. I should add that uh, Frank Loy, in his earlier incarnation as president of the German Marshall Fund in the United States, as many of you know, actually was the creator of our Institute for International Economics and a faithful member of our board ever since. So I'm sure he'll be back, <laughs> despite my comments about his role in Kyoto. Alan. Alan Wolf, uh, Dewey and LeBach. Uh, first of all, thank you for a really excellent uh, presentation. As always, the uh, Institute is uh, in the forefront of issues of the time. Um, my question is closing the gap between China and the United States. Uh, China has a somewhat different perspective on all of this than uh, we do. We just got religion. Uh, they profess to have a little touch of religion. Uh, and, uh, but one of the things that is said by Chinese uh, officials at present is you people want to buy our products that are carbon intensive, you ought to share some of the burden of buying those products. It shouldn't just be on the producer, it ought to be on the consumer as well. So one, and another aspect will be a number of countries say uh, there has to be technology transfer, something you didn't touch upon in the remarks, presumably you touched upon in the book. But like in TRIPS with respect to pharmaceuticals, there really has to be some provision for mandatory technology transfer or else we who are behind you can't really, we don't have a level playing field. So my question is, what is the middle ground with the middle kingdom? Well, Ellen, as usual, you've come right to the point of it. And I think uh, if the US and China can get together, Copenhagen will be a success and also the whole program of limiting emissions will be a success, and if they can't, it won't. Um, so that is the, a foremost uh, challenge for obviously Ambassador Stern, but uh, Secretary of State Clinton and everybody else in, in, involved in this uh, party, and I think they recognize it and are addressing it. Now, coming specifically to the consumption versus the production issue, the problem I have with trying to go to a consumption uh, type of arithmetic, and I, I can see your arguments for it, but uh, the ability to limit um, carbon emissions as you fan out into a wider number of consumers and producers and, and vast larger becomes much harder. And therein lies the story of uh, trying to limit uh, carbon emissions on gasoline. But we, we really can't politically do it at the consumer level, so we try to do it to automotive design and, <clears throat> and cafe standards and the like, but that applies to many other products. So that's what daunts me on going to consumption and arithmetic. However, it's by no means a closed issue. And when we talk about state systems in our country or in Canada, provincial systems, the difference between production and consumption is very large for some states. And therefore, this will become an acute issue internally. It's less for big powers like the United States and China, but it's still there. Um, and the open question right now on the consumption production is how do you allocate air, transport, shipping? And that's a big issue and has not been resolved. But in any event, I'm still more or less on the production side of the 
control. On the uh, technology transfer, yes, you have, you have, you have made the arguments. Uh, I'm, I, I think there's an, a huge difference between the arguments that were made in the IPR context for pharmaceuticals and the arguments that are made for um, uh, carbon limiting technology, CCS technologies, or, or whatever else. And I really think uh, going to mandatory technology transfer without compensation to companies will do just a lot to uh, arrest the technology that we need in all these areas and would be a disaster. But I'm sure there are other views on that. Uh, next question here, and then I'm going to take the liberty of pointing a finger at John Jackson, if I may. Uh, as most, most of you know, John was the godfather, if not the actual father, of the whole WTO and is the uh, juridical scholar on the system uh, that we all pay obeisance to. So, John, if you have a comment or uh, observation, we'd love to get it, and I'll give you much time to prepare that as the next question or take. So you go ahead. All right. It's a little tough to go before Professor Jackson. Uh, Charlotte Hebebrand from the International Food and Agricultural Trade Policy Council. Um, congratulations on a really good book. I have a comment and I think what is a question. My comment is that your work focuses on emissions and, and certainly rightly so, but that there's another whole aspect to the climate change negotiations which deals with sequestration, and certainly forestry is now in the negotiations. I suspect that agriculture may also enter the negotiations because I think it is one of the areas where developing countries will actually be able to make some commitments, perhaps more easily than on the emission side. And certainly we've all heard uh, some of the noises in the U.S. about uh, farmers here perhaps uh, being uh, encouraged to look towards environmental payment uh, for, for their future uh, government payments or in this case, I guess, from, from the carbon markets. So just to say that there's another whole WTO agreement that comes into play here, which is the agreement on agriculture, and that's something that uh, my group is trying to, to do some work on. My question is on standards. Um, we have, as you know, under the WTO, the TBT and the SBS agreement, and I think the climate change measures would fall under the TBT agreement, if I understood you correctly. I wonder whether there is not scope for coming up with a new international standard setting body. Um, and I'm thinking here of something similar to what we have on the SBS side. We have very clearly designated international standard setting bodies, the Codex, the OIE, the IPPC, that sort of set the international consensus for standards. On the TBD side, it's really much messier. Um, international standards are encouraged, but the agreement is very vague about what actually constitutes an international standard. We've had an incredible um, proliferation of sustainability standards and schemes. Does this new uh, uh, climate change agreement perhaps provide an opportunity to bring some coherence on, on standards? Thank you. Yeah, uh, Charlotte, thank you for that, for that uh, thoughtful comment as well as the, the question. Uh, with respect to the TBT agreement, a threshold question is whether it applies to standards that are not purely product standards, but rather get into the, to the manufacture of a product, such as energy used. And we argue that we think it will be interpreted that way eventually. If so, there is a rule under the TBT agreement, Article 2.4, that requires the use of international standards unless they are inappropriate for a particular country. And we, we mentioned that briefly in the book, but one could imagine as, and there are lots of standard setting organizations now on climate, including the ISO, which is doing climate st standards. Uh, those are all standards under the TBT agreement. It doesn't have a specific list of organizations uh, in the same way as SBS, but any international standard setting organization comes under TBT. So there is a lot of scope in the future for bringing those standards into the trading system as, in, in effect as norms if we determine that the TBT agreement applies to those types of standards. Okay, Professor Jackson gets the last word, as usual. <laughs> Not as usual, but, <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I'm at a little bit of a handicap here because I've read the manuscript several times, but I haven't read the book. Uh, and I have the impression, maybe wrong, that you've toughened the uh, recommendations in the book more towards the code idea. Uh, 
Am I wrong on that? Well, Jason has worked through about 30 drafts. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? Well, let, let me not get hung up on that. Let, let me just say that I, I think the idea of negotiating instead of litigating is very sound here uh, because these are really complex issues and they really need to be worked out. So what can we do if you can't get a full consensus and we can't get, it's, it's absolutely, almost absolutely certain we couldn't get a full consensus of the organization. So you're dealing with, uh, I think it was suggested maybe 20 uh, person, 20 uh, governments that would cover 85 or 90 percent of the problem and that would be ideal if you could get all those. But you'd really have to have China, I think, and Brazil and, and probably uh, India. Uh, and we know how difficult some of those uh, part, parties are to bring into a fold. So then one of the questions is if you have something short of that number. If you have that number, then the rest of the world uh, can bring cases and, and collect a little bit of compensation here and there and it just doesn't matter. But if you don't have all those, then the question is if a smaller group, a group of four or eight or uh, uh, so on, go ahead, then you begin to really encounter some of these problems about border adjustments to avoid the competitive things. And I think that's the real tough nut. And I don't know how to predict whether you, I, first of all, if you, it's really worth the effort to try and get that. There's no doubt about that. But then what's the fallback? Um, and the fallback, I think, really pushes you against this question, are you going to abide, are you going to have measures that really violate the WTO and just uh, just live with them? And that's, that's the, the tough nut, and I don't know exactly how to overcome that, and I'm hoping, like I assume the rest of you are, that we can get a negotiated agreement, and that would be ideal. I'm trying to be short. <laughs> well, John, there are probably as many people answering that question differently as a, as a question because it is very provocative and it goes back to what uh, Alan said in one of the earlier questions. My, my view, which uh, we haven't, we didn't debate this amongst ourselves as authors, but my view is that the U.S. should give it a good faith try for like, three years, four years maybe, and after that, then I would subscribe to a very narrow code, which maybe only had the U.S., Canada, EU, a few others, Mexico, Japan, but didn't have China and India. And I would go for restricting measures if, if we can believe. Border restricted measures. Oh, restricting measures against Indian, let's be right up, against Indian China. Pretty hard. If four or five years from now the trajectory of global warming as previewed by uh, Lord Stern turned out to be right. I think it's a serious enough problem. But we've got, uh, I think, a little time to make that decision. But it's a tough one. Okay. Many thanks to our authors, Gary, Steve, Geeson. Again, thanks to the Duke Foundation, Cargill, others that made the study possible. This is a topic we'll be continuing to discuss here very actively with frequent meetings of this type. So we thank all of you for coming and look forward to further installments in the program. Meeting adjourned.